Hello there and welcome to a new episode here in which I'm not sitting in front of my clavichord today but in front of my ERAR 1866 piano and that has a reason and the reason is that this the topic of this video is about a 19th century edition of Bach Wohltemperierte Klavier, Well-Tempered uh, Klavier, that was sold a few years ago. And now you might say, what's the thing about a 19th century edition that's been sold a few years ago? Well, listen to this. That copy of Bach belonged to Pauline Tjazaren, a totally unknown name to me and I guess also to you, but Pauline was a student of Frédéric Chopin. So that copy belonged to her as a student of Chopin. She, on her turn, by the way, was a teacher of Cosima Liszt. And Cosima Liszt, you know, that's the daughter of Liszt. She married first to Hans von Bülow, then she got a divorce and she married to Richard Wagner. So important enough, that connection. But the most important thing is about that edition, that in that copy of the Bach work, of Bach Wolterbrite Clavier, are annotations in the hand of Frédéric Chopin. And not just a few, there are really e extensive, very detailed annotations in Frédéric Chopin's hand written in pencil. And why he has done that and what exactly he has written, that's really worth our time. So stay here with me for a few minutes because I promise this will be an exciting episode. First off, if you wonder what the clavichord guy has to do with the music of Frédéric Chopin, you might be interested to know that a few years ago, actually a few decades ago, around the year 2000, I've played intensively this piano, this Irar piano. It's a beautiful piano and I've devoted much of my time back then to the music of Chopin. I've played literally almost every solo work of Chopin. Unfortunately, there was not such a thing as YouTube. I do have many rehearsal recordings still and actually also recorded one CD recording at the time, which I never released. I was a little bit shy back then. I still am, but I guess really I am, but I'm just better in hiding that. But I never released that CD because it had also, it contained also many elements uh, related to tempo research that I still do today. So I think releasing that CD at that time would be a big shock, as it probably would be today. There is on my channel, uh, I will link it here, almost a full CD of um, uh, that uh, recording, and so you can listen to that. It's only not included is the opening piece of the CD, which is the Opus 10 number no. 1 with a famous C major etude of Chopin. And I think still today that would be a shock to many people to listen to that in what I believe also is for Chopin the metrical use of the metronome. So, but that's another topic, maybe we'll dive into that in the future. But there is another reason also why Chopin and Bach is important. You should not forget that in the midst of the 19th century, and actually we are talking now before that, because Chopin obviously, uh, he died in 1849, so he didn't uh, reach the midst of the 19th century. But certainly at the beginning and in, in, in the first quarter, 1820, 1825, 30, something like that, we are in the midst of the big Bach revival. We should not forget that also in France this was a big thing. So for Chopin, playing Bach was something that was really important and many of his students, and you can read that for instance in this book, um, I will link this in the description. This is Chopin, pianist and teacher, seen by his pupils, by Eigeldinger. I have read this extensively. This is really gold if you want to dig into Chopin's music as are the letters, of course. This is really interesting to read and also very nice to read. It, you can read it in the late hours on your sofa with a glass of wine. But in that time, Bach was a big deal and also to Chopin. So we should not forget that the Bach revival has started, as I see it, with C.P.E. Bach. In the 18th century, he advocated the works of his father in a time that nobody, almost no small circles were interested, but on a, on a large scale, of course, that was a period of the gallant music that then you, he talked to Forkel, and Forkel really established a kind of statue for Bach with his Bach biography. They had connections worldwide, Griepenkerl, Mendelssohn, they all, all were connected. Then you have Czerny, a big name in the Bach, re Bach revival. Now we come back to that in this episode related to Chopin. All of that, also, of course, accumulated into the magnificent performance of the Matthias Passion by Mendelssohn, which we today see as the 
big moment of the Bach revival, but actually there was a culmination of what was going on for more than five or six or seven decades. So in the midst of all of that, we have here Chopin, not only as a composer, but also as a brilliant teacher and performer, and that's what we are looking for. That's what interests us in this episode, to see if we, from these annotations, can learn something, not only on the way he might have performed Bach, but what the um, overall attitude was around his and his students. So this copy of Pauline Chazaren has only a few preludes and fugues edited or annotated by Chopin. I do not have that copy. I wish I had the budget to just buy every book that really would be interesting to have on my bookshelf. But it's not really important and i tell you why. If you look to the C major, C sharp major uh, prelude, which is uh, the, the, the scan that's provided on the internet, and there are some others, um, two things are really striking. First off, it's the level of detail in which Chopin annotated that music. Now, we can assume, if you look to that score, if I would annotate that so detailed for my student, that probably would be given a detailed insight in how I would like to have that piece performed. So we can assume that if Chopin would be invited tomorrow to play Bach, Walter, and Prix Clavier in Carnegie Hall, that he, the chance is really big that he would perform it according to that score. Well, that's important to remember. That's an important fact. And although from the whole edition, there are only a few pages, I think even a dozen pages with uh, Chopin's uh, annotations, it's really important to know that because it gives us a direction which otherwise we would be completely in the dark. But the second thing is maybe even more important. If you look to the metronome numbers, and yes, Chopin was a big metronome guy. He metronomized almost all of his solo music and actually almost all of his music. Um, he also annotated or noted down the metronome marks in which obviously he wanted his students to play the music, the speeds. But if you look at them, and you are familiar with this edition, which is, um, this is an original um, 19th century edition. It's maybe not the first edition, but this is Czerny, Bach, Voltempri de Clavier. Then, if you're familiar with this edition, you will immediately see the correlation, because the metronome marks are exactly those of Czerny. And this is important. And not only the metronome marks are exactly those of Czerny, everything in that edition, everything that Chopin as annotated, and the copy of his student comes from the Czerny Bach edition. And with this element, we, stood, we should stand still for a moment. So two things are important here to stand still for a moment. First off, would you ever have thought it possible that a great performer that Chopin doubtlessly was would have turned to a Viennese edition to fuel him with ideas on the performance of Bach? And he apparently cancelled, so to say, his whole individual approach. That's important to stand still for a moment, because today we are, in our musical world, we are looking to performances from a way different perspective. We expect, if you listen to my performance of a Bach piece, you expect me to be personal, to be individual, to have my own story, uh, connected to the music of Bach, which is interesting enough, and that's that's our time, and that's fine. But in that time, apparently, there was not such a thing as being very individual in what they already concerned to be early music. We should not forget we're talking not on the performance of Beethoven, even was very contemporary music in that time still. I, I even believe it was contemporary music, but Bach they considered to be early music. So there Chopin grabbed a Viennese uh, source. He went back to Karl Czerny to give that information to his student. And secondly, this tells us something about the position Karl Czerny had. We today, we look back, we look very much down on Karl Czerny as a composer, as a person who is Actually, we remember him often as the, the guy who wrote these annoying etudes that we had to play faster and faster and faster in our piano lessons. But if you dive into the history, you 
you will see that Carlos Czerny was one of the big musicians of that time, very much respected. He composed over a thousand opus numbers. And no, right, not all of the music is on the same level, although Franz Liszt would have said later that, Fran that Carlos Czerny, if he would have taken more time for composition, he would have ended up being one of our big, really big composers. So he was a very talented guy also on the field of performance. He was a great musician, was one of Beethoven's best students. We should not forget that. And there you have Chopin. Of course, he traveled to Vienna. He met Karel Czerny. Um, there are some letters in which he actually looked down on Karel Czerny and uh, actually one letter, and that's taken today as a proof, so to say, that Chopin should, uh, didn't have to do anything with, with, with Czerny. But that's not the case. We see now from this edition only how important as a source Carlos Czerny was to actually complete the, the entire world. So the big Frédéric Chopin, I cannot underline it enough, um, to Carl Czerny, that's the composer that we are looking down to, that's the performer that we even not consider to be a great performer, that's something we even not consider any more important in the Bach study in our historically informed performance practice, and I come back to that because this is a really important point. For Chopin, he was good enough to copy in detail with his own hand and pencil every notation that Czerny had given, pianos, pianissimos, forte, fortissimo, crescendo, decrescendo, everything at exactly the same spot to be played, Bach, to have Bach played in exactly the same way. So that should trigger our minds. And let me now come to what's interesting for us. Uh, I believe already this knowledge and this insight, this perspective, looking back to that score with this perspective alone is interesting enough to study the work and the, the personality and the musician of Chopin. I think that's an important statement already. But there is something else. You know, on this channel, I devote a lot of time to try to reconstruct the original 18th century tempi, early 19th century tempi. Metronome numbers are, for me, one of the most, if not the, the most important historical musical facts. They are, for me, way above anything that is written, even CPE Bach's book, because metronome numbers are not to be manipulated. There you have a discussion about that um, metronomes were not ticking in the right speed, but that's all nonsense. If you dive into that, you will know that. But those metronome numbers are not to be manipulated. You can take the single beat, you can take the double beat on that in a moment. But Chinese metronome numbers in our historically informed performance practice are never, almost never, considered. And if they are mentioned, they are mentioned in a way to prove that those metronomes of those, those times are just indications of how idealistically fast that music should be played. Chopin, however, and this is important, Chopin took the time to copy those metronome numbers in this score. And let's stand still for th with this uh, fact for a moment, because it is really important. If people say that those early 19th century metronome numbers are so fast that nobody played in them, or some even say that the people back then were more, much more talented than we are, so genetically they must have been different, but that's, of course, totally nonsense. Well, uh, then we must assume that Chopin considered those tempi to be fine for him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have copied them. And he was not a person, he was not a composer, he was not a performer who was not aware about metronome numbers. I've said before in this video, he literally, I think, 80% if not 90% of his solo works are given to us with the metronome numbers, or maybe 80%, a lot of them. So he was very aware of the use of the metronome. And if we can believe people like Mikuli, who was one of his important students who made a complete edition of his works in his foreword, Dairy Preface, he says, Mikuli, that the metronome was never far away from his piano, Chopin's piano, so his students often have to play with the metronome. So the, 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 the conclusion, only the, if only one conclusion can be drawn, is that those metronome numbers given by Czerny are considered to be very fine and truthful to, 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 to Chopin. Now, you can say, that's fine. What do we learn from that? Because it's not historic at all. Yes, that's right. So 
We must consider that Shani lived in a time where reconstruction of the performance practice in the time of Bach was maybe not on, on, on his first point of interest. But if we look to what Shani writes about him, it's interesting enough to realize that Shani was aware of the evolution in historical informed performance practice. Because he says, well, I'm giving you the speed indications first. Um, as I see the effect of those pieces, though the effect is the mood, is the um, overall emotion that that piece had or should have. So his tempo, a connects tempo with um, the overall expression of the piece, the very historic, something we should um, talk more and more today because tempo movement is really the foundation of everything you build up as a musician. So he's aware of that. Secondly, he says, I've given a lot of the fugues, uh, the metronome numbers, as I remember Beethoven has played them. So important enough, does it tell us something about Bach? No, but Beethoven was a musician of his time, lived closer to Bach, and if only, it gives us the information of how Beethoven played those fugues. And thirdly, Jenny explicitly writes that he is aware of the fact that in Bach's time, Allegro tempi were a little bit slower than in his time. So how far can you go in really understanding that Jenny was aware of the evolution of performance practice. Now, if he was right or not, that's something else, but he was concerned about it. Now comes the point. If we take those metronome numbers, literal, they are in the most cases of this uh, Walter Prix de Clavier and other Bach works totally unplayable. And if you would manage to do that, some of them of course are, it doesn't make any sense. We will not dive into this metronome thing very extensively, only because we could say a lot of things only on this prelude and fugue. But it is interesting to see that Chopin took those metronome numbers seriously. And now you can listen to people who defend single beat in a way that's sometimes hard for me to understand because the practical, this is about music, you should play it and not talk too much about it. And so many of those tempi are simply impossible. That tells us something, at least without a theory. Think about that when looking back to Jen. Well, that was everything for this episode. I hope you liked that. If this is your first uh, time here on Authentic Sound, I'd love to have you subscribe. Of course, I'm giving you a lot of my own performances, but on Wednesdays we have always these kind of thought videos on these topics, on tempo, other topics, performance practice, and so on. So, would appreciate if you give this video a thumbs up and join the authentic community, sound community, by hitting that subscribe button. And then we see each other very soon again. Bye.